Hello and welcome to Everyday Law, the show that demystifies the law for you and your family. I'm your host, Attorney Robert Monahan, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Sharanya Guru Rajan. Perfect. Did I say that right? Perfect. Yes. I've practiced. <laughs> Sharanya and I are old friends. Uh, when I went out on my own, Sharanya was one of my first uh, office friends. She, I officed with her employer at the time, and she was also one of the first guests on my show. Radio show, yes. Radio show on my radio show. That was about two and a half years ago, and we talked about bankruptcy, yes. and that's what we'll talk about today. Usually we film in the Lamb's Farm Magnolia Cafe. Today we're filming in the Libertyville Civic Center. It's a little more stripped down, but I think that's appropriate for the topic. Yes. Because we're talking about bankruptcy today. Um, Sharanya, when we first had our radio show, was working for Ralph Schwab and Shever and those Correct. guys, right? Yes. Yeah. But now you're on your own. SG Law. So, so there's a lot of, lot of things that happened since yes. we, we first uh, had you on the good show. Things, good yes. things, good things. Yes. Um, so where should we start? Where should we start? Uh, I can start with a little bit about myself Go and ahead. where I started and how I started. Um, well, hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be on Bob's show. Bob's a great friend, uh, a great lawyer, uh, and I've um, learned a lot from him over the years and have been inspired by him over the years. So thank you, Bob. You said um, before I was one of your inspirations <laughs> to maybe yes. go out on your own and start your own so, practice. I should say that, Bob, you were uh, one of my first... Uh, good friends who was a solo practitioner. A solo, yeah. Yes, and at the time I met you, going out on my own as a lawyer was a thought that I wasn't entertaining and didn't think I would. But inside you, something you knew yes. someday you wanted to be on your own. I right? saw how excited you were yeah, uh, about every yeah. file that you took on, every client that came to see you. Yeah. It, it's just, it's a lot more. Especially in the early days, I was really excited. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it is definitely a unique experience to know that someone is coming to you for you for your value valuable advice and it's that much more pressure of yeah. course but you take it not that when you're an associate working for another firm you consider the case any less important but um when but it's someone, all you it's, it's all, all you. you when it, you're on it's your own you. it's all you Correct. so that's great so yeah. it's been very exciting and um and as a solo it's that much more important to have a good network yeah of other solo yeah. practitioners and you're a great networker yeah yeah so, we, we have to you. build a we have to relationships build, yes. and everything else yes yes huh. so it's been great. Anyway, a little bit about myself. Um, I started, I graduated from the wonderful University of Illinois College of Law, yeah. Havana Champaign, in 2005. Um, and that time period is very, uh, is important in the bankruptcy perspective right. because the um, bankruptcy code changed. In 2005. 2005. When did you graduate? I graduated in, in July and I was licensed in September, I yeah. think October. Uh, but the law changed October 16th of 2005. 2005, yeah. Now, wait, so. let's give context. So before the law changed in 2005, it had previously been changed. The bankruptcy code had been changed in 1978 mm -hmm. to become more lenient yes. for, um, for debtors, mm -hmm. to be easier on the debtors. Right. And I think in 2005, they wanted to tighten up the reins a little bit on right. debtors. The right? pendulum yeah. swung the other way. There was a lot of creditor lobbying going on in, uh, in Washington. And the general mood amongst lawmakers and, and the public was that, well, I don't know about the public, but I think lawmakers and lobbyists was that debtors' attorneys and debtors were in some way in cahoots or you know, conspiring to take advantage of the bankruptcy code. I don't know what it was, but yeah. it wasn't true. Yeah. It wasn't true. Because good things and bad things happen everywhere. Yeah. And you can't just um, stereotype a, a particular group of people because that's what the law ended up being. Not favorable to creditors in certain ways, not favorable to debtors in certain ways. And as any law, it's imperfect, yeah. which makes lawyers like us busy yeah. um, and gives us a lot of opportunity to go into court and try and make case law by, by litigating several And you issues. were very busy when you first started. I remember right. you told me this story because the law was changing. Everyone was very apprehensive yes. about what the law would be, yes. how it would turn out, what it meant even. And so people wanted to get in before the deadline, before, right. the, before that, that date the law changed. We so when you first start, of, you, <laughs> yes, yes, a lot, a of, lot of filings. A lot of and people wanted to file their petition. I was a brand new attorney. And I, it was a sink or swim situation where my boss came to me and said, well, this is an individual who's looking to file for bankruptcy, and he needs to decide whether he should file a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13. Which we'll get to, Chapter 7, we'll Chapter 13. That. We'll get to that, yes. He said, Sharanya, Miss Brand New Lawyer, you get to talk to this client, uh, gather the facts, gather the, the financial situation, and determine and help him decide yeah. whether he should be filing a Chapter 7 liquidation bankruptcy or a Chapter 13 repayment plan So you bankruptcy. were facing stress right away. Big 
decisions right away. Helping clients is always, um, well, when a client comes to you, uh, especially in a bankruptcy case, they're distressed, yes. they're nervous, they're underwater, mm -hmm. and I bet they're scared, right? Yes, yeah. yes. and yeah. they're not they're not very proud of where they're at in their yeah. lives. And they they're never, embarrassed, right? They're very embarrassed. Yeah. And especially as a young lawyer at the time, I had grown men walking into the conference room and sitting down in front of me and just hanging their head in shame. Yeah. Because they felt like they had failed themselves, yeah. their businesses, their families, and they had to pretty much open up their financial to lives you. to me. So you could help to them. to complete strangers like their creditors, the trustee, the bankruptcy judge. So I found myself very early on realizing that this was not just a legal job. This was also a therapist job, <laughs> a little bit of psychology involved, mm. a little bit of, you know, maneuvering feelings and uh, emotions. Yeah. So I consider that to be the fun part of it because I always felt like if I hadn't become a lawyer, I would have become a psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know the psychology. It, it was, I like that How to that reassure part. people. Yes, how to reassure mm. people and make them feel like they were not being judged by me or the system because this is precisely why the system is in place. Right. This is precisely why we have a bankruptcy code to forgive honest debts and to give honest debtors a fair, fresh start. So Sharanya, can you tell us what are the two main types of bankruptcy? Yes, so the two um, major ones that everyone hears about. Because you know, there's more than two, there's right? More there's more than there's two. The, at least three that I know about, seven, Four, 11, and 13. Yeah. What's the other one? So uh, there's there's also a, a nine, I believe, a nine. for municipalities, okay. Okay. but I don't know much. For municipalities like Detroit or something. Yes. Got yes, it, exactly. okay. Right. We so, hope not to hear of many of those. No, okay. no, but interesting The main area ones law. are, for, for, for consumers anyway, yes. would be seven and 13, right? right. Okay, right. go ahead, what are they? So the chapter seven bankruptcy is the one that most people want to be in because uh, it's, for, in layman's terms, it's the quick and dirty one okay. where you're in it for um, you know maybe four to six months if all goes well and or even less time and you get your discharge. Got it. So a chapter seven bankruptcy is a liquidation bankruptcy okay. where the debtor, um, it's an individual who files the bankruptcy and uh, all of their assets are put out there for the bankruptcy trustee to look at, for the creditors to look at, um, to see how they're valued. Um, and depending on whether there's any equity in those assets mm -hmm. over and above the exemption amount. Okay. Uh, an exemption amount is the amount that's protected from creditors. Mm -hmm. And every state has a different amount of exemption that okay. it gives to its uh, debtors. Okay. But over and above the exemption amount, if there is equity, sufficient for the trustee to sell, mm -hmm. then the trustee will sell it to pay um, a cents on the dollar to creditors who are owed money by the debtor. Wow. If there are no assets, if the debtor puts everything out there and there are no assets with value, with equity over and above the exemption amount, sufficient for the trustee to sell, then the creditors get paid nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, the debtor at that point um, has to wait for 60 days from the time he or she filed the bankruptcy case to see if any creditors are going to object to his or her discharge. If nothing happens in 60 days, their discharge will come through. Okay. So that's a liquidation bankruptcy. Okay. That's chapter seven. Yes. And the beautiful thing about chapter seven, I mean, in the very layman's terms that I understand, is that you, um, it's liquidation. Yes. Like you said, you take the assets, you sell the assets and you leave with kind of a clean slate. Yes. Your 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 debts are wiped out, your obligations yes. are wiped out, and you're not on a payment plan. No. They're just gone. Right. Right? Okay. Right. So chapter seven sounds appealing in some ways, but maybe not. I mean, they, they take your stuff and sell it. Yes, yeah, so it, it that's where the bankruptcy attorney's role comes in. Okay. To take every case on a fact, by, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. For some individuals, a Chapter 7 may not work because they have a home with significant amount Which of equity. Which they don't want to, they don't want to they sell. Don't lose. Yeah, yeah. In that case, you look to a Chapter 13. 13. What's a Chapter 13? A Chapter 13 bankruptcy is otherwise known as a wage earner's plan. Okay. Where um, it, there is no liquidation. Okay. You so still have to declare or disclose all of the assets that you own, okay. just like you would in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. But in that case, the trustee, whom we'll talk about in a second, yeah. who he is, the trustee's role is to collect payments okay. from the debtor over the course of three to five years okay. to pay back the creditors either 100% of the amount that's owed or 10%, anywhere in between. Wherever they can fit. Yes. Okay, so at the end of a seven, at the end of a seven, there's a clean slate, a yes. fresh start, mm -hmm. there's no payment plan. Right. 
but you don't. You, you may have a barrel. You may be wearing a barrel. Right. But but at the end of a 13, there's a payment plan yes. that can last three to five years, yes. and you make a plan to pay out to your right. creditors. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, let's talk about for a minute. Let's talk about who the main players in a bankruptcy sure. are. Who. Um, it starts with the petitions, let's right. say. So, so the debtor files a petition. The debtor files a petition. The debtor is represented by an attorney, so yeah. that those are the two individuals there. And then you have creditors. The creditors are the entities or the individuals who are owed money right. prior to filing the bankruptcy case. That's okay. key. So the filing of the bankruptcy petition draws a line in the sand. Any debts that the debtor owes prior or before the bankruptcy filing are the ones that are discharged. Pre-petition debts. Pre-petition debts. Got it. So before Very the petition important. comes, those can be discharged in a seven or worked out in a thirteen. Right. But post-petition debts are something post different. Post-petition debts are okay. not. So it's a line in the sand. So you want to time that bankruptcy petition accordingly, and that's one of the strategies that bankruptcy debtors, attorneys, you know, always look into to make sure that that petition is filed at the right time. That's really interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there's also other timing considerations, but coming back to the parties, there's the debtor, the debtor's attorney, the creditor, and then there's the trustee, the all-important trustee. It's very interesting yes. because when you declare bankruptcy, an estate is created. Yes. And in our last show, we talked about wills and trusts and probate. Correct. Yeah. And in probate, an estate is created when yeah. you die. Yes. And the same thing, <clears throat> and the executor oversees the yes. estate. In a bankruptcy, an estate is created when you declare right. bankruptcy. But does the trustee oversee the estate? The or? trustee oversees the estate, but not for the benefit of the debtor. Not for the benefit of not the debtor. Not for the benefit of okay. the debtor. It's All right. for the benefit of the creditors, okay. really. Mm -hmm. um, and the trustee, so it's, it's an interesting dichotomy because the trustee steps into the shoes of the debtor for purposes of owning the assets of the debtor. Okay. But administers the assets for the benefit of the creditor. That's it's a very interesting role. When you say for when you say the first point, when you say the trustee steps into the shoes of the debtor for the purposes of owning the assets, you mean the trustee wants to get the highest value possible yes. when liquidating the assets yes. or valuing the assets. Right. Okay. And the trustee it. has the right to market those assets as the debtor because the trustee now has an equitable interest, yeah. a legal and equitable interest in those That's assets. That's really interesting. Up to the point that the trustee either relinquishes his interest in the asset yeah. or there is a discharge and a closing of the estate. Got it. So that's why I always tell my clients, when you file a bankruptcy, it's not, you can't do it willy-nilly. You can't just say, I'm going to file it and then dismiss it because if there is an asset of value in there, yeah. it's like you're walking into the shark's jaw. Yeah. Mouth. <laughs> the trustee will catch the asset and not let you dismiss the mm. case because he's now interested in selling that for the benefit of creditors. And there's one more player, and that's the judge. The bankruptcy judge, the, bankruptcy the all judge. important bankruptcy judge. <laughs> you yes. can't leave out the judge. And our judges in the Northern <clears throat> District of Illinois are phenomenal judges. Okay. Phenomenal judges. Okay. All right. So when you file a bankruptcy, it starts with a petition. Yes. And we're talking about the important players being the debtor, the creditors, the trustee, the judge, and there's one more. There's the, one more. What's the last one? So that is the U.S. Uh, United States Trustee's Office, which is a division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. They are the, I like to call them the big wigs who are sitting up in Washington, and they have several regional divisions across the country, and of course ours is the Northern District of Illinois. Yeah. The U.S. Trustee's job is, um, they're like the policemen of the bankruptcy uh, mm. world, where their job is to make sure that bankruptcy debtors are not in any way trying to take advantage of or manipulating the bankruptcy system to get an unfair discharge. So their job is to make sure that your income is properly reported, okay. your expenses are properly reported, you are qualifying for a Chapter 7, without getting too technical, you're qualifying for the Chapter 7 pursuant to what's called the means test. The means test. test, oh yeah, we talked was, about that on the radio show. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Which was the biggest change of the 2005. The bankruptcy amendment in 2005, exactly. yeah. yeah. The means test is the is an additional document. It's it's sort of like a tax return where you claim you put down your income, you claim certain deductions, certain allowances. The bankruptcy code allows you to take. When you complete that form, we literally get either a sad face or a smiley <laughs> face on our software. And okay. I'm not kidding you. And all of us bankruptcy attorneys are waiting for that green smiley face because if you don't get that green smiley face at the end of putting in all your numbers, it means that you don't 
qualify for a Chapter 7 bankruptcy filing. Uh, you have to make now... Make too much money. You make too much money, your disposable income too is high. too high. Uh, Therefore, the United States Department of Justice and the, and the United States Trustee's Office is to make sure that you haven't um, had any sort of fudge factors with those uh, numbers. They look at those li line items with a fine-tooth comb up uh -huh. in Chicago, and every time... We as bankruptcy debtor attorneys, when we go to what's called the creditors meeting with our clients, we hope and pray that there are no additional questions from the United States trustee's <laughs> office with respect to our clients. So yeah. they're a major player. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. And again, the means test is meant to keep the debtor honest, I guess. Yes. And, and it was meant to solve the problem of uh, debtors wanting to go into Chapter 7 when they make too much, when money. They make right. too much money. Right. And they could have been on a payment plan in Chapter 13, yes. Yes. but they just wanted to liquidate all their debts. Right. Got it. Okay, okay. Now, can we talk a little bit about the bankruptcy process? Sure. Because there's a really important provision um, that as soon as you file, it comes into play. Right. It's the automatic stay. It's the holy grail. Yeah, One the of the holy grails, <laughs> apart from the discharge of the discharge is, yeah. right, but, that's but the, the automatic grail. stay. Yes, yeah. a lot of people file a bankruptcy case just simply for the automatic stay. And for, for lack of a better word, I would call it you know time for some, it gives you a breathing room, yeah. bre breathing space, because if you have been hit by lawsuits, if you are being pursued aggressively by creditors, yeah. the minute that bankruptcy case is filed and that creditor has actual notice of a bankruptcy yeah. filing, they are stopped at their Hands heels off. Hands by off. this amazing legal concept called the automatic, automatic stay. stay. Because if you, as the creditor, willfully violate that automatic stay, what happens to you? You get hit with sanctions <laughs> that you don't want to know what they're about. Okay, I don't so, want to know. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sanctions plus attorneys' fees, which okay. is which is the you know double whammy right there. So, so the creditor, the creditors, so you. You're, you're in bad shape. Yes. You've been hounded by creditors. They're calling you. Right. They're knocking on your door. They're filing summons and complaints against yes. you. Yes. You're having to go to court. You're like, I can't take it anymore. Right. I'll file bankruptcy. And the automatic say stops all of yes. that like that, right? Stops them at their heels. No questions asked because if you want to ask a question, yeah. you better come into court with what's called a motion to lift the automatic stay okay. and ask a bankruptcy judge permission uh, based on whether there is any reason to lift the automatic stay. You better have, you know, a legal basis to ask for that automatic stay to be lifted. And if that's the case, a judge will grant that to you. But until you get that order, you as the creditor better be very careful. You pay a high price for bankruptcy in terms of um, the effect on your credit yes. score. But, I mean, just to have that relief, that right. maybe temporary relief, it, it sounds like maybe it's worth it sometimes to people. Yes, and, and you hit on a, a great point, Bob, because the relief that you get if the bankruptcy goes well and yeah. you have been represented by a good bankruptcy attorney and you get the discharge, the relief that you get is so big yeah. that in return, the process, the system, the courts expect 100% candor, yeah. honesty, and disclosure from you as the debtor. You never lie to your attorney. Mm -mm. Don't lie to your attorney. No. Don't lie to your accountant. Right. Don't lie to your priest, your minister, your rabbi, whatever right. it may be, right? right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask you one more question before we take a little break. Sure. And let's say you have a debtor. This is about different kinds of debts that mm -hmm. come to you. Right. And let's say you have a debtor that comes to you with a kind of bucket of, um, of different kinds mm -hmm. of debts, because I know Debts can be classified in different sure. ways. So let's say the, the debtor comes to you and says, Sharanya, I can't pay my bills anymore. I want to see if bankruptcy is an option. But I have a student loan. Mm -hmm. I have uh, some credit card debt. Mm -hmm. My mortgage hasn't been paid. Mm -hmm. And you know I haven't paid my taxes this mm -hmm. year. Are they all the same? They're not. They're and not, right? They're not. And like you said, there are different categories of debts. Yeah. And the beauty of bankruptcy is, Similarly situated creditors have to be treated That's a big similarly. Yeah. Correct. So fairness is a big deal yeah. in bankruptcy court. Um, mortgages are secured debts because okay. they are secured by collateral. Yes. Credit the card home. debts, exactly. The home. Credit card debts are unsecured debts yes. because they're not secured by any collateral and they fall at the bottom of the rung. Yes. Um, taxes, Uncle Sam has a very important 
position in the whole in the whole. They get uh, some priority. State. Yeah, they the federal get, government always does. They always get priority, even if they're unsecured. Okay. So they're priority non-dischargeable certain okay. times. Okay. So that's another category. So if a client did walk into my office, and student and say, loans, student loans, student loans are unsecured, but non-dischargeable. That's that's the thing. I that's, mean, that really. And I'm hoping someone in Washington wakes up and, and decides to do something about it. It's because uh, hard it's on huge students. Burden. Hard on students. Huge burden. Yeah. Um, but if someone were to walk into my office and say some, exactly what you just told me, I would I would ask them, if you want to keep your house, yeah. let's prioritize the mortgage debts. Okay. If you have excess balances sitting in your bank account yeah. over and above the exemption amount, yeah. then I would say use that money to pay your student loans mm. and your taxes because money that you're ha is sitting in a bank account should go towards paying non-dischargeable debts. Because mm. guess why? In, when you file the bankruptcy, those debts are not going away. Right. So pay your mortgage if you want to keep your house. Pay those taxes, especially if they're only three years old, and pay um, those student loan debts the credit card debts, because of the fact that they're unsecured and dischargeable, are always going into the pile where you don't pay. Okay, okay. Now, Sharanya, we were talking before um, in the break, and you said that people file bankruptcy now. It's different than during the Great Recession. Right. And people are filing bankruptcy now mostly to save their home when it's in danger. Yes. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. During the recession, homes didn't have equity. So mm. it didn't make... Practical and that was sense. because people were taking the appreciation in their home and borrowing against it. Is that right? Also, the values were plummeting. And then the values plummeted. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that, so, so they were left with debts with no equity. Yes. Yeah. So it didn't make sense for them to attempt to save their homes. So mm. a Chapter 7 bankruptcy made sense because what a Chapter 7 bankruptcy did was extinguish their personal legal obligation to pay on the mortgage note. Got it. But remember, <clears throat> an important principle of bankruptcy is liens pass through bankruptcy unaffected. Ah. So in a Chapter 7 and bankruptcy. I think that's what property interests are not affected, but contractual right. interests are. Is right. that right? So the contractual obligation to pay is discharged. Got it. But the lien, the the lenders, the attachment on rights, the property. Exactly. They don't they don't get extinguished in a bankruptcy. So that uh, mortgage lien passes through unaffected. So once the bankruptcy debtor in a Chapter Seven gets a discharge, he cannot he or she cannot be personally sued anymore for any amount owed on the house. Prepetition. But yeah. the bank has to still foreclose on the lien. So it bought homeowners extra time in the home, oh. mortgage-free, plus a discharge on their personal obligations. But now that the Great Recession has passed, the yeah. pendulum is slowly swinging the other way. Yeah. Values are rising, yeah. but not fast enough. No. But for some homeowners, it makes sense to try and stay in the home for various reasons, like kids in the school district, yeah. kids need to finish out school, oh, it just yeah. works for a professional reason. So in order, if you find yourself in that situation where you have a lot of unsecured credit card debts and a mortgage debt, but, you, but you've fallen behind because yeah. you had a, a temporary loss of income and now you're back on your feet, but you cannot make all those payments in one swoop, right. a Chapter 13 bankruptcy is very handy. Wow. If all of the facts and circumstances fall into place. A Chapter 13 is very tricky. You need a very qualified lawyer to hold your hands through Tell a me 13. a little bit about it. So what a Chapter 13 bankruptcy allows you to do is pay back those arrears that you owe your lender over three to five years right. interest-free. Wow. That's the beauty of it. When you say your lender, do you mean your, your mortgage your lender? Your mortgage company, right. Wow. So if all the circumstances are correct um, and say you've fallen back three or four months, then what a Chapter 13 bankruptcy allows you to do is file the petition and pay back those arrears over five years, plus make your ongoing payments going forward. Wow. So that's why you have to have sufficient income, sufficient disposable right. income to make those two payments. Now, there are some people out there who are in that situation where they've landed a new job with higher income after having fallen into bad, you know, a bad period. So it works great for those individuals who can catch up Three to five years, interest free. Let me ask you this: so, so you're in mortgage debt. Yes. So you haven't been paying your mortgage, and your mortgage is three thousand dollars, and you haven't paid it for three months. Yes. So you have nine thousand dollars in debt. Right. You declare ba bankruptcy in Chapter Thirteen. Yes. So that nine thousand dollars gets frozen, and over three to five Divided years. Divided by sixty. Yep. You can pay it back over three to five years, yes. interest free. Yes. While you continue to make your mortgage right. payments. 
Correct. Wow. And also in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, if you have a junior mortgage or a secondary lien on your home mm -hmm. that is completely unsecured, meaning, example, let's say you have a house that's worth $100,000, mm -hmm. and your first mortgage is one hundred and twenty, mm -hmm. and your second mortgage is thirty. Mm -hmm. So there is no value in the house to support mm -hmm. that junior lien. Mm -hmm. In a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, if that secondary lien exists on your primary home, you can strip it. Wow. Strip it of its secured status. Wow. And at that point, it's treated as an unsecured debt, like a credit card. So if you're paying 10 cents on the dollar to your credit cards, guess what? That mm. second mortgage, which was previously uh, at the level of a secured creditor, is now getting paid like a credit card company 10 cents on the dollar. So you have now wiped out a lien a junior lien, mm -hmm. and you also now have the time to pay back arrears that you owe on that, on that first mortgage, hopefully the value of your home will rise and soon you'll at least be able to equalize. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yes. And that's a very different situation than what we had talked about before on the radio show, which was sort of at the tail end of the Great Recession. Yes. But yeah. That's a very interesting thing that, that, um, that when you owe mortgage debt on your house, you can put the brakes on, on it, get on a payment plan yes. for that debt, continue to pay the mortgage going forward and kind of make things fixed again. Yes. But it affects your credit. Does yeah, it still, still affect affects your credit? Your credit. It affects, I mean, by then, it's difficult to repair your credit because you've been late on your mortgage payment. You're late on your mortgage payment. What difference does it make? Exactly. When you're, when you're heading towards bankruptcy, your credit's suffering anyway. Yes. So why not just go all in, right. get it all taken care of? And attempt to get that fresh start. Yes.